so maybe we can start uh, a little bit of housekeeping now, I think. Uh, first of all, thanks to everybody who's, uh, who's logged on today to, to join the webinar. We're excited to chat with you. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things. There are a couple of ways that you can um, ask questions. There's a Q&A button um, at the, should be at the top of, uh, of your window um, that you can enter questions into, but you can also drop them right into the chat. And Carly, who's uh, kind enough to moderate the webinar today, will uh, bring them to our attention. And if she um, can find a spot where we're not talking, she will answer them in the flow of their webinar. But if not, we'll, we'll handle questions at the end. Um, so yeah, that's just about, that's about it. Also, we'll, we'll be recording the webinar. So, um, if you'd like us to send you the recording after all you got to do is shoot us an email and we're happy to send it on. Um, we're also going to break it into smaller chunks, um, so that, uh, you know, it's, it's more digestible. So if you prefer to get the chunks, we'll need a couple of days to get those uh, broken up, but happy to send it to you. However, um, suits. So we're about uh, two and a half minutes after 1.30 Eastern, so I guess we can um, get started. Um, so thanks again for joining. So today we're going to talk about how financial institutions can upskill remote employees. Uh, my name is John Finlay. I'm the CEO of Lemonade LXP. Um, and I have with me Romeo Mayoni, who is the Director of Business Solutions and who played uh, a, a major role in architecting the Lemonade platform. So we're lucky to have Romeo join. Um, and get his, uh, his take on, on uh, distance learning and lemonade. So let's get started. So I wanted to talk first about um, the state of remote working before the pandemic. Um, before things uh, got a little crazy, um, about 4.9% of the workforce worked from home uh, permanently. So that's about 8 million folks. 31% um, worked from home occasionally, so about 52 million people. Um, and only 27% of companies offered some form of remote working, despite the fact that 80% of employees actually wanted to work remotely. So there was an appetite for it amongst employees, but a little bit of reluctance amongst their employers. So during the pandemic, at-home workers grew to about 110 million, which is about 13, a 13x 13 increase, which is pretty substantial. And so far, organizations have reported actually an increase in productivity um, due to the lack of commute, less distractions, um, less meetings, and so forth. And um, in a recent survey, I, I read that 35% of employees don't miss the office at all. So there's definitely an appetite um, for, for remote, um, remote work. Um, so as we move through the pandemic and post, um, employees are saying, 60% of employees are saying they'd like to continue working from home. 35% said they would change jobs in order to work from home, and 30% would take a pay cut to work from home. So there's a tremendous appetite to continue working from home amongst, amongst workers. And there's some big benefits um, for their employers. The employer saves an average of $22,000 a year per employee and in increased productivity, lower real estate costs, reduced absenteeism, and lower turnover. So some pretty big advantages for the employers, but also for the employee, um, the average employee will save six to eight, 10K a year um, in, in travel, parking, and food. Um, but I think the bigger one is 22 days a year saved in travel time. And certainly I know for myself, I've got small kids. Um, life is busy, you've got activities and so forth. To sort of save that travel time is just huge. So I think there's, um, there's going to be a big push towards staying remote. Um, and I know that some organizations have said they're going to keep um, employees remote until there's until there's um, uh, a cure or so it could be uh, could be a while um, but there's challenges for remote workers I mean there, there's some challenges that are sort of just practical like technology um, how do you ensure productivity how do you foster collaboration then there's kind of more soft challenges um, in um, driving or in, in, um, creating great morale and culture. And I think that ties into training. And so I think training remote staff is going to, is going to be crucial, um, a crucial part of enabling a work, remote workforce. Um, so some of the challenges of training remote staff, um, first of all, um, when we talk to our clients and their, and their employees, a lot of employees don't say that their learning experiences are kind of static. Um, and that kind of has created an aversion to training. Um, and so I think over, finding ways to overcome that aversion so that you can drive participation and drive repeat engagement because if the experience isn't great,
driving participation is going to be tricky. And even if you get them to participate, um, if the experience is static, getting them to come back and take more training is going to be tricky. So I think there's some significant challenges um, that we have to overcome to train remote staff. Um, so what are the key attributes of an, of an effective remote training program? First of all, I think it needs to be self-paced. Um, you know, the line between your personal life and your work life is blurred a lot in the pandemic, and you find folks working at very strange hours. And so if you were to say you have to take training at a specific time, I think um, it, it won't be the right way to go with the at-home worker who want, want, will want to take it self-paced um, when they're free and when it works for them. Um, I think you want to drive distributed practice rather than providing a, a ton of information in either a, a, you know, um, a screen share or PDF. I think you want to get people to take training ongoing small chunks each day. Um, and I, ideally, we'd like to be able to deliver that within the flow of work. Um, employees aren't in a situation where they can just turn to employees to ask questions. So sometimes they'll want to be able to take training and reference that information right within the flow of work. I, as I mentioned in the previous slide, it's got to be interactive and engaging. We're competing against a different set of distractions at home, kids, pets, the fridge, Netflix. Um, I, think we have to, uh, I think we have to make our training really engaging and really interactive. I also think um, a lot of folks at home, one of the only complaints of working from home is feeling a little bit isolated and lacking that social and collaborative element. So I think your, your, your training needs to have social elements and give people the ability to collaborate. Also, um, with all of the changes being imposed by the pandemic, particularly in the financial industry with new programs, uh, policies rolling out and so forth, I think you need very fast authoring um, so that you can create new um, e-learning programs and roll them out very quickly um, because the world is changing so quickly through this pandemic. And then lastly, it's gotta be trackable. You gotta be able to spot your superstars, your slackers and see which content is resonating uh, and whether people are actually learning and whether it um, is, is affecting how they, how they behave in their jobs. So I think those are the really key attributes of an effective remote learning program. So what are our options? Now, the first one might be the learning management system, but it comes with a, a bunch of challenges. First of all, a lot of, a lot of LMSs are on-prem, um, so employees have to VPN in to access them. And for any organization that is of, of reasonable size, that's not going to be tenable. Um, so I think that on-prem learning management systems probably aren't the best way to go. But moreover, when we talk to employees about their LMS experience, they complain that the experience is pretty static. And so what you see is participation is low. In fact, the uh, average employee only participates in an LMS course just once. Um, and engagement is also low. And that drives uh, an increase in employee apathy about training. So I think um, if you're on sort of one of the traditional learning management systems, I don't think that's gonna be the best way to train remote staff. So next you could go with live video conferencing, sort of um, remote instructor led training, which I think has a place. I think a blended approach is really the way to go, but it is inherently passive uh, and it's also prone to distraction. People will multitask. Some of you may actually be multitasking while watching this webinar, um, but I think that's what happens um, when you're broadcasting to a remote because it is passive. And um, I think it's also, not quite as effective because people could be multitasking. And then you've got the issues of limited tracking. You can see who participated, but it's hard to measure efficacy and retention. So another option is online courses, the kind of canned solutions that you can buy from a number of vendors. And I think those can play a role for sure. Um, and some of them are really quite good, but they do tend to be passive. They're mostly videos, PowerPoints, long form content. Um, but uh, I think they can pay or play a role, but again, it's gonna be tricky to drive the repetition needed to drive real learning outcomes. So you'll see if there's no rep repetition, you'll see lower retention rates. Um, also there's limited tracking. You can see the people participated and sometimes you can see a score, um, but not really in depth tracking of when they're, when they're participating and um, whether there were significant learning outcomes. Next, we mentioned all of the change that's being imposed by the pandemic. Um, these courses are not customized, so they tend to be generic CAN solutions. Um, and so when you've got to train on new policies or new processes that, or new programs that are being rolled out, uh, they're not going to be the right solution. And then lastly, it can be pretty expensive because, um, you know, when you buy CAN courses, it's you pay per employee and it can be, you know, a couple hundred bucks per employee. And if you're an organization of some size, 
that's not going to be uh, tenable um, for room training your remote staff. So those are, I think, some of the options and some of the challenges. I do think a great option is taking a game-based approach. Um, and the reason that I think that is, I mentioned, first of all, that um, you're up against some pretty significant distractions at home and different ones that they had at the office. And so I think we really need to up our game and make our training um, more engaging and more, more magnetic. And what we see from with game-based learning is high participation rates. Um, it's also a very active learning experience where you're being challenged to, to, to um, provide input to the system and you get feedback. And so you're really leaning forward as opposed to leaning back watching a video or, or listening to someone talk. Um, it's also inherently chunked into micro learning, small like micro learning chunks, which I think is the way to go. Um, being able to get people to take a couple minutes out of their day to take training and do that, do it, you know, every day, I think is really the way to go. And game-based learning really lends itself well to that. Um, and it drives that sort of high reps and distributed practice that you need to, to drive learning outcomes. Um, and I think ultimately, um, if people are participating daily and taking small chunks of training, um, kind of like a pro athlete would go and practice shooting baskets every day as opposed to doing it all in one day and thinking that they're good at it. Um, I think you're going to get better out learning outcomes and ultimately better ROI. But I want to distinguish between um, gamification and game-based learning. Um, they're two very, very different things. So gamification is the process of adding games or game-like elements um, to uh, something such as a training task. Um, where game-based learning is actually taking the content itself and morphing it into a game. I'm going to give you just a couple of quick examples. So here is a, a, a learning SID platform, and you can see here that it offers points and badges and progress meters and different courses. Um, but if we go and take a look at the courseware itself, it's still long-form content. So where someone might read an extra PDF, watch an extra video because they got a badge, um, that uptick in engagement is going to be ephemeral because the points and badges really don't have any context um, outside of the platform. And so um, they're, they're really just adding game elements to the same old content. And I don't think that's the right way to go. Another example is um, this learning platform, learning platforms that allow you to watch a video or, or read the content, and then they reward you um, with games that you can play casual games that aren't related to the training. The challenge there is there's so many good websites with casual games out there that are way better than the ones that you'll see in a platform. So I'm not sure why anybody would endure the training uh, just to get to a casual game that's a lesser game than they could access on other sites. So I don't believe that's the right solution. I believe the right solution is to actually morph your training content into a game so that people learn through play. Um, and Romeo, I'm gonna hand it over to Romeo at this point to give you, um, show you sort of an example of how you can do that um, and make training um, very magnetic, very interactive and very effective. So I'm gonna hand it over to Romeo. Thank you very much, John. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Romeo, I'm LaunchFire's Director of Business Solutions, which was uh, a title we picked because I love saying I'm the Director of BS at parties. That's the energy I try to bring to, to a dinner party. Uh, so what we're looking at now is the main narrative view for uh, for employees on the platform. And what I want to do is show you some practical examples of how some of the stuff John talked about can be brought to life so you can see some of those elements and how people actually learn. So the first thing you'll notice looking at this is that it absolutely is not uh, an LMS. It's got kind of buttons that, that beg to be pressed and levels that are beg to be reached. And it really feels like uh, a fun experience. We premised it off the most addictive mobile games, but we wanted to still make it feel relevant to our clients. So as you can see in the experience, you're building a bank in a, in a city. And the way that the experience works is you earn money from training and then you spend that money on, on boosters to improve your bank. So if I jump into phone channel, you can see the type of items that I can purchase with that money that I, I very carefully won uh, through training. And each one of these boosters does something different. So there's a, an element of strategy associated to it. Because when you've got a uh, remote workforce training, I think big part of what you need to do is make sure you have triggers and reasons for them to come back to it frequently. Uh, in an LMS, that really just doesn't exist. Uh, you you kind of hope that when they need that information, that's where they go. 
But what you want, I think, in a scenario where you've got a majority of employees distance learning is an experience that draws them back naturally uh, every day. And I think that uh, this sort of experience does a really good job at giving people a reason to participate frequently. But of course, the whole thing uh, only works if you, if you do the training. That's, that's what gives you the money. That's what lets you progress through the narrative. Uh, and what we wanted to do and make sure we had is, like John said, we wanted a self-directed learning environment. Uh, Top-down learning is, is really quite passe. And I think with remote work, what you're trying to do is, is capture people's attention, but also let them direct the flow of learning themselves. So we wanted a, a list of courses that's exclusively relevant to them as an employee and doesn't have extra materials that uh, wouldn't appeal to them or be relevant to their work. And we also wanted to make sure that it was chunked out in those micro-learning pieces that John talked about. So each one of these uh, pieces of training is short, easily digestible, and sort of marketed as such to employees so they can see uh, how fast it is. So you can see right here, I'm going into something that's only three minutes long. You kind of get that knowledge going in as a player, and you know you can just have one of these experiences and then move on with the, the rest of your workday. So as John said, what we really try to do uh, whenever possible is rather than just add badges and leaderboards to experiences, we try to transform it into a game. So especially with bank training, and I've been working with banks for a long time, um, your training can be really boring, <laughs> to be honest. And what we do in this scenario is we take that long form training that you've got, and our system embeds errors into it. And so what the user has to do is find those mistakes in context and correct them. And while this might seem easy at first, the first time you run through this content, you really have to read through the content fairly carefully to be able to find these mistakes. And what we've realized is that actually lets people truly know that information cold moving forward because they have to really read through it and pick out those mistakes and try to avoid losing hearts by picking the wrong stuff. So people approach it really uh, thoughtfully rather than rushing through an LMS course, which I know is an experience I'm sure everyone on the call has had. I shamefully just smash the next button and often don't read at all when I'm on an LMS. And I, I, don't, I don't think I'm alone there. Um, but when we're done around, you can see that it connects directly back to the narrative. So you're right back in that engaging loop of uh, had more clients, I'm achingly close to level five. And if I did poorly on this round, I would try and immediately correct that by, by trying again and, and getting that information in. Now, when a round's finished, we like to have some social collaborative elements. Because I know uh, as a fairly social person, this is something that certainly affected me in moving to remote work, is you can feel a little isolated and a little alienated from, from your peers. So we like to have collegial elements throughout the platform to keep people uh, connected and also using training as a hub for community because it's a great spot for, for getting people's input. So you can see that we have message boards below each course. Uh, this one is someone being rude about my appearance, but it's subjective folks, so, so you never know. And what we also like to do is have star ratings on every course so that uh, you can uh, measure kind of more quantitatively how people are responding to the content and how relevant it is to them. So you've got different ways of, of interacting with your peers uh, throughout the program. We've got 13 different types of game-based learning rounds. I'm only going to show you one more so you've got a sense of what we can do with information and the different ways that we can tackle the same problem using different tactics to keep the information fresh and, and engaging for people as they go through it. So this round is really a, a role play scenario. So rather than uh, just watch a video or a slideshow, we put you in a real conversation with, with a potential customer or sometimes a peer, uh, depending on what type of, of training you're going through. I know this has been really fun and useful in uh, anti-money laundering training is certainly a way that we've used it uh, before. And what's great about this is I think rather than just, uh, you know, learning perhaps the information about a product, this really teaches you how to talk about it. Uh, certain slip-ups you can make, conversational hooks that you can use to talk about things that sometimes uh, can be difficult to talk about, or at least take a level of emotional intelligence that I think goes beyond uh, what a classic e-learning course would give you. So it's kind of the, the conversational hooks you need to, 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 to progress. Um, the last type of round that I wanted to show you before I get into um, you know, authoring and tracking and, and a few of those pieces is I wanted to show you how we do product training. Because I think this is a, an important part of uh, the remote work experience when you don't have those one-on-one -on -one, 
uh, mentoring sessions all the time or as frequently as you do in the sort of casual learning that happens when most people aren't remote. So when you have a new product process or service that your employees need to know, uh, it's really helpful to recreate that experience. Uh, and you, you kind of lose a lot when you make a video or a slideshow about a product, but when you actually have to walk through a product yourself and learn where to go and how to navigate um, how these work, it really helps your frontline staff gain the confidence that they need to approach these situations better. Uh, and I think it's that confidence that really is kind of the, the last mile in learning about products. You can gain all the information, but until you run through it yourself in an active way, rather than passive, like, like John talked about, you're not gonna understand it to the degree that you're willing to talk about it uh, with a customer, even in a, in, a, in a remote scenario. So those are three examples of just the, the type of rounds that, that we offer and that we think um, that type of spirit is something that sh probably could usually be replicated in, in most bank training. We've also got different ways to, to socialize with, with peers. You can find and follow staff, build a sort of club uh, in your organization where you're tracking their successes and discussing challenges. And of course, for the competitive crowd, there's uh, a leaderboard. I tragically am in eighth place. Uh, I'm gonna work my way back to the top. So everybody, everybody above me, watch out. Uh, the last two things I wanted to look at really quickly is, is tracking. Because I do think with game-based learning, you have access to a lot more information that you wouldn't, uh, that you wouldn't otherwise. And I think that's uh, kind of neat to look at. So because you've got um, all these different interaction points with game-based learning. People are engaging frequently, but they're also entering a lot of information. You can glean a lot more from each round than you can with traditional LMS and e-learning. You can see when and how people are participating. You can see on a content level where people are struggling. And overall, you can see uh, how effective the system is. because You can see how much people have improved over their baseline. So you can really get a, just at a glance, a sense of how your training organization is going, some gaps that need to be filled, and, and where, you can, uh, where, where you can really improve it. So I think that's uh, a kind of unique value prop from, from game-based learning and something that uh, certainly could be very useful. The last thing I wanted to look at is authoring. So uh, you know that, that long form content round that I showed you quickly where you spot the error? I just wanted to show you how quickly it is to, to write those in a platform. So I know that part of remote learning is you need to be able to move really quickly. I can see John's face changing when he sees this, but keep in mind, this is the correct text. And what you've got to do is add in deviation points. So I'm going to say rather than great, he's a very bald CEO and I'll put very mediocre, but keep in mind, these are incorrect points. And what the user has to do when they come into the round is spot that error and then correct it to show that he is in fact great. Uh, so I just wanted to show a lot of practical ways we could apply uh, some of the stuff that, that John's been talking about. And now I'll, I'll shoot back to him to, to talk quickly about results, best practices, and then get into your questions. Thanks, guys. Okay, Romeo, thank you very much for the uh, vote of confidence. Amazing. So I think as we get back um, to sort of looking at what the best practices are for remote game-based learning, I think uh, there's a few key ones. Uh, first of all, being cloud-based, I think is really, really important. It allows employees to access the, the system whenever they want, however they want. Um, you, I, I should have probably put also accessible on all devices. I think those are the two key elements that enable employees to take training when it works for them. Um, I think also that central narrative game, um, it really differentiates from sort of um, a gamification or gamified training program and ties performance back into something that's a, a fun experience for users, which I think um, is welcome in, in today's sort of uh, socially isolated world. Um, the other thing is for us, we, we try to make it so that the content is the game, so that we morph the, 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 the actual learning content into a game so people learn through play. And then I think a, a blended approach, um, you know, I think including some mentoring, including some um, collaboration and stuff like that, I think are very important because people are feeling a little bit isolated. And so I think you want to be able to incorporate that. So it's not just all you're, you're sitting at a, at a screen uh, taking challenges in the, in the game-based learning program. If there can be some collaboration, um, uh, I think that would be, um, make the training much more compelling. So just to give you a sense of um, um, some of the kind of results you can get from a game-based approach, uh, we see uh, regularly about an 84% voluntary participation rate, which is, which is pretty high. Um, and we typically see about a 25% increase in employee knowledge. 
And then when we survey employees uh, after they uh, take they take the training, about 92% say they prefer Lemonade training to other training, while 88% would like to see other training delivered through Lemonade. And so um, Lemonade we used as an example to show game-based learning. There are other platforms out there, but I think it's really the approach um, that we want to that we want to highlight. I do believe that a game-based approach is really going to be the most effective way to engage an at-home worker um, and to make the training experience compelling enough that they want to take it regularly. So that's what we our presentation for today. I, I wonder if there are any questions, Carly. Yeah, we've got a couple really, really great questions here. Um, first, uh, Darlene wants to know how is the content created? So Lemonade has a, a very robust set of authoring tools that are very, very fast. Um, you can author everything from games to product simulations, to role play scenarios, to uh, mentoring sessions, to remote instructor led training, all within Lemonade's authoring tools. And they're all baked right in and they're super easy to use. So unlike some learning platforms where you have to use Articulate or Captivate other tools, um, Lemonade has it all baked into one. Okay, great. Um, uh, next, we have a question from David. He wants to know what uh, the average size company um, that Lemonade works with. That's a great question. We tend to work with financial institutions that are somewhere between 500 million in assets and 10 billion. We do have some larger clients and some smaller ones, but that tends to be um, where the majority of our clients fall. Uh, and Brian asked uh, if they will be, if people will be receiving the webinar recording. I can answer that one really quickly. Yes, we will be recording this and uh, sending it out as soon as possible. Joe wants to know if we have bank compliance courses that we have already built. That's a great question. Um, we get that question a lot. Um, and so we are, we have just started working on a partnership with a compliance company who is going to um, put compliance training within the Lemonade environment. We're actually just in the process of rolling out this week, rolling out a content exchange. So if you imagine each of our clients um, on an org chart, um, they each have a box on one horizontal row. And if you imagine one row up is one box and that's the Lemonade's content exchange. And then our clients will be able to find content on the exchange that they want and download it into their Lemonade instance. Um, we have made an investment in content ourselves. We're gonna be launching over a hundred uh, modules uh, into the content exchange. And then we will be creating partnerships with other organizations who will sell their content through the Lemonade Content Exchange. So yeah, compliance training is coming. It's not there yet, but it will be there very soon. Okay, we are getting a bunch of questions. I don't know if we'll be able to answer them all. So if we don't get to your question live, we will be reaching out to you via email with some answers. How about we do one more here? Um, the question is, how do we help new clients learn our program? Ah, we have a... We have a customer success team that um, has a, an onboarding blueprint that is super fast. Um, it takes about somewhere between five and 10 hours of, of a bit of training and a bit of support uh, and you're up and running. And once you're up and running, it's so easy. We have virtually no support tickets. So it's a pretty fast process. And yes, we do use games to teach you about how to make games, which is kind of a fun element. Okay, I think that might be it. Everyone else, we if we didn't get to your question, we you'll be getting an email from us very soon. Thank you very much, everybody, for making time in your busy day for for to listen to us talk about lemonade and talk about distance learning. We really appreciate it.